good evening. It looks like I froze there a minute. Oh, it's just about time to go for 7 o'clock tonight, the Bible study for Cross Point Fellowship, Wednesday nights. And how are you, Ken? Thanks for joining. So we have From the Inside Out by Hillsong that we'll listen to here for a little bit as we're waiting on others to come in. Thanks for coming and joining. Sure appreciate you for coming in and joining. Thank you. I hope, I don't hope, I know so that it'll be a benefit for you. It'll be a good benefit to come. Hi, Maria. I almost have to have my glasses on to see you close enough. <laughs> Mary is here, so hi Mary. We're just waiting on others to come in. We're welcoming you as you come in. And thank you very much for coming in. We sure appreciate you. Our music, we don't own the rights to. The music that you hear in the background here. Um, it's from the inside out. From Hillsong. To be consumed from the inside out. Hi, Shen Kui. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. So you're welcome. Welcome to our midweek service. Welcome. Our in Christ realities. To know the reality of being in Christ and Christ being real in you and I. We're going to come into study some of these things through the point of being identified with Christ, our identity in Christ. Hi, Doris. There's some names and people that I recognize. I know that some people are from a long distance away, and so I definitely. Thank you for coming and watching. And as you're coming in, um, if you would, if you feel like you would like to share the link with one of your friends, family, whoever you would like to share with, um, share it with them. Be a blessing to others. You're going to be blessed. I'm going to be blessed. I like this part because I get to sit beside myself and hear sometimes what the Holy Spirit has to say because I want to lend myself to Him for, for our purpose. So thanks for coming and joining. I appreciate it. Thank you, Lord. So we'll just keep waiting here for a little while for others to come and join. And again, if you'd like to share the link, please do so. Hi, Steve. We're listening to Hill Song from the Inside Out. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Well, thanks, Dolores. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Consume us from the inside out, Lord. Consume us. <laughs> to be consumed by the Lord. This is my desire. It's my desire for the, the wholeness of the church, the whole church, to actually be consumed from, by the Lord set on fire by Him, but consumed personally by Him. Consumed. <laughs> Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. We'll just stay in a place of worship, drawing from the Holy Spirit, 
And the more that you draw from the Holy Spirit, the more you'll draw out of me. And that's the way that I like it the most is when others are drawing from me and pulling on my heart, pulling on my spirit, because I have to rely on the Holy Spirit and I draw out of him. Just like the Bible says, you know, the Holy Spirit doesn't come to speak on his own, but that which he receives or that's what he takes from the Father. That which he takes that belongs to Christ and shows it to us. And as he draws out, it's because we're pulling on him. And I desire to pull on him for all the information, for everything that is to come out of us. I, I believe that it's important for us to understand, understand that it's the Holy Spirit who's doing the work. That his choice is to work in us, work through us, and to do all that he does. So the more you draw on me, I draw on him. We come as a unit to draw on him. And so I lend myself to him, I give myself to him for this purpose. So we're still waiting on others, we still have another five minutes or so to go before we start. We're going to be speaking about our identity in Christ. We're keeping up the um, theme that's going on with our church, In Christ Realities. In Christ Realities. To come into the understanding of Christ, but having Him real in our lives. Not as He's the book, but we become living epistles. And over the next number of weeks, we'll get into the place of learning how to be a living epistle. Not somebody who can just quote the word, read the word, and pray, but become a living epistle in our identity in Christ. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. We're going to have... Um, uh, questions and answers and so at any point in time that you have a question um, you can put your question up on the screen type it in and um, you later tonight and throughout whatever it takes for me to answer your questions I will send you back an answer for whatever I can um, answer and um, secondly if I can't I will um, pass that on to one of our pastors who is far more knowledgeable than I am that can reach into your heart the way that it's required. And so, whatever you have a choice for as we're going along, if you have a question, don't be shy. Put your question up and we'll do what we can to answer. There's Christina, how are you? Welcome. So welcome to you all. And at this time, I just want to say thanks again to Apostle Elijah and to Pastor Nadia. Thanks for, thank you for the opportunity again. I appreciate you so much. I appreciate you giving me a space to speak and um, to pass on some of the things that the Holy Spirit has shown me. And this will, all of us will be able to help the church grow into the perfection of Christ so I, I appreciate you so much and thank you again I appreciate you so there, if there's anybody that wants to share the link um, go ahead um, we'd all appreciate it so that we're all reaching out as far as we can reach we got friends and family that that need to hear the gospel not that they don't need to we all do no matter how much we know we still need to hear more to come into the reality of Christ because you have a point that I don't have and I need your point as much as you need mine and so I appreciate if you share it with those um, who you can so thank you very much thank you so I'm gonna pray I'm gonna pray for all of you and I want to tell you first of all you know, Crosspoint's motto is, we love God and we love people. And I fit into this category with you because I definitely love you. I definitely love you. I love you with 
the love that our leaders love you with, and I've been consumed by the amount of love that they have you. The very first introduction that I had to this church was through my friend Margit, who said, Carrie, the pastor here, he loves the people. And I'm here because love has changed me too. And I know that it's real. It's true. And so this church loves you because we've learned to love God. We've learned that God loves us and we're passing on everywhere we can. So Father in heaven, in Jesus' name, I pray for every person. Every ear listening, I pray for Father. I pray for an open ear, for an open heart, an understanding heart. I pray for wisdom to come upon each person. Father, that we come to seek wisdom like it's a hidden treasure. Father, I ask you to glorify yourself in this time to glorify yourself. Father, I'm asking you to bring the reality of us in Christ, for us to be in Christ, knowing that we are in Christ. Father, we love you. We love you and we first of all thank you for loving us. Without you loving us, it would be impossible that we could love you. So I want to tell you, Father, I appreciate you and I appreciate every person, every person that's listening and to those who they'll share it with. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I'm dry. So we're going to be talking about our identity in Christ, but we first of all have to understand our own identity. <clears throat> How can we identify with Christ? We're going to get into an area once we get going to understand something that's far bigger than an identity coming into the likeness of in our identity. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Father. You know, for us to be identified in Christ or our identity to be in Christ, just something for you to think about over the next number of weeks that we're talking. You know, what identified what identifies Jesus in us? Jesus himself said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. A father's identity was in Christ. Christ identified himself with the Father. So we're going to come to the place of discovering our own identity and then our identity into Christ. Our identity in Christ and identifying Christ in us. Um, I'm a little nervous, so please forgive me. <laughs> um, and uh, here we go, we'll start flowing. What the definition of identity is. Who are you? If you had to sit down and write it out, which I'm going to ask you to do, I'm going to ask you to write out, get a notepad, um, after this time, through the week, as you're thinking about yourself, write down what identifies you personally. The way that we think about ourselves and how we're viewed by the world or how we're viewed by others. How are we, what are our characteristics, what are the characteristics that define us? An example of identity is, we'll say, the person's name. I can tell you a story about my own name, Carrie. My name was something that identified me. When I was in grade three and then I was in grade six, there was two girls in my class named Carrie and myself. It, it was a name that I did not like. It was feminine, like a boy named Sue. <laughs> and I have to, and still I'm um, overcoming, the fact that my the identity of my name was something that hindered me from blossoming to who I should be. I, I hid because of my name. So my identity was, I want to say, held back, um, stunted because of the way that I thought people would look at me because of my name so it was a hard thing for me and others you know all around we all have an identity in things in ourselves that have hindered us and we're going to come into this in a little while 
So what, what defines us in our character? Lots of other definitions that come to place, the things that define us, is your country of origin. What, what, what about your country that you were born in and, and all of the um, customs of your country? The clothing, the foods, you know, e even a smell can cause our identity to quicken just like that because of the smell of um, a food that was from our countries. Um, a lot of the friends that I have that are from different countries in Africa and they wear different clothing. I'm pretty sure that each one of them can look at themselves and see the clothing that they wear and they can look at somebody else that's wearing a different type of clothing and they could know what country they're from because of the clothing. So our clothing, the way that we wear our clothing identifies us. As we grow up, grew up as a teenager, we could not <laughs> go along without wearing everything that was stylish for the day while we were in high school. We had to be like everybody else. Every, it, it was odd if you didn't dress the same, have your hair the same. Everything was a matter of our identity of whether we would be accepted with the crowd or we wouldn't be accepted with the crowd by the way that we were dressed. This is the way that um, uh, we've been designed in our system of this world, in the fashion of the world. We've been designed to try to find our identity in the things that are around us. In our own heritage, in our family upbringing. You can look at your cousins, you can see some cousins did um, certain things and we did other things, but yet you knew you were still a unit when you were all together because we were all alike. We, we all had so much characteristics together and we still enjoyed things that were together because our families were always together. And our aunts and uncles used to do things that all of us would get together and do those things. And now I can look at our individual families as us as children grew up, that some of those characteristics are still playing out in our family members. And how do you enjoy those or dislike those, those things that define us? We can, we can look at our DNA. Our DNA, when it's examined, pick you out of 7 billion people in the world. <laughs> so science has narrowed down our identity through DNA to the smallest margin that is known at this time for us to be identified to identify us but I like this one little thing the thought just that comes to my mind God knows the number of your hairs so he identifies you in a different way he, he knows us in a fashion that science doesn't know us at you might be able to see us by DNA but he can look at our head and say oh I know that's Carrie look at the number of his hair you know he he's he's found us so important that he identifies us in a, in a manner that is good for us. So we can have our job identify us. We can have our car or our truck identify us. We can have things identify us that we use to identify ourselves in. And generally when we do things like that, we're using that thing to protect us, to, to define us and bring out things, you know, um, that, that either b accentuate our definition or, de or drop it down, degrade it by what my job might be. If, if I'm somebody that is in, um, in, um, lower position job, 
am I embarrassed because I'm in that position of a job? Does that position of that job define who I am? Or if I'm the CEO, does that define me by being the CEO that others look up to you? But is that truly your definition? What is your definition, the definition of you behind closed doors? What is your character when nobody's watching? I really want us to think about the ideas of who we are. Who, who am I? You can't answer who I am. You can definitely look at me and tell me some things about me. There's things about me that I never knew about myself at all until I started doing a video like this and I realized, well, I talk out of one side of my mouth a little bit. <laughs> I played with my beard all the time. Things that I, I did that I didn't know that I did until I could see myself doing them. Every one of us are alike. Every single one of us are alike. The Bible says that everything is open and naked before God. Nothing's hidden. And how much of our lives do we do we want to hide, try to hide, embarrass of, put a shield up against to protect? What is our identity? What stops our identity from blossoming and shining? What holds us back from our the greatest potential that we have? Our identity is a thing that that Satan can use to stop us from being the greatest potential and fulfilling the purpose of God that God predestined for us to walk in. Our own identity can be a hindrance, whether it's on a good side or a bad side. Our own identity, if, if it's prideful, prideful will the pride will stop us from and hinder us from um, fulfilling God's purpose in our lives. Being shy and and um, uh, timid, those things will stop us from blossoming and going out. A little notes from Kenneth Hagen. I don't know if you all know Kenneth Hagen. He's passed away now, but he was a very good man. He says, when you identify yourself with Christ, God gives us a new identity. Instead of sinner, we're called Christian. Instead of lost, we're considered to be found. Instead of an enemy, we're called a friend. Instead of unrighteous, we're called righteous. Instead of sick, we're called healed. Instead of poor, we're called rich. When we understand our identity with Christ, we'll no longer be weak will be strong and more stable as a Christian. Our faith will work better and our prayer life will be enhanced. And we will walk in a new level of authority. Those are notes from Kenneth Hagin. You know, we say a, a thing, and I know I, was, I should have had some Bible scriptures written down, but I'm just going to only speak of them. And we say that the joy of the Lord is our strength. And we're, a lot of people, we think, you know, this is m that when I'm joyful, it's my strength. But the truth about it is, is when the joy of my father, when my father's well pleased with me, that's caused me to be strong. I was driving home one time with my son, you know, he might have been four years old at the time, somewhere there in there. And we were driving along, you know, I just had this urge to say to him, you know, I love you, buddy. And so I said, you know, you know, buddy, I love you. And that little guy, he looked at me and he did something just as crazy as can be. And he looked right at me and you know what he said? He said, how come, dad? <laughs> and I thought, oh, you're not supposed to ask that question. You're just supposed to say, yes, I love you too. How come you're asking me why I love you? He's only four years old. I can't say, well, you did good in school. 
You play hockey well. You talk well. There wasn't a whole pile of things over those four years, even though that there was many things to be proud of. But how do you say those things? So I had to say to him, you know, I love you because you're mine. I love you because you're mine. And he looked right in my face and he said, well, then I love you too, Dad. He identified himself with me when I said to him, because you're mine, I love you. Not because you can or can't do anything, but because you're mine, I love you. He identified himself as mine, as my son. Jesus, he was baptized. Whatever would Jesus have to be baptized for? But Jesus was baptized by, by John the Baptist. And he said to him, you know, he said, John the Baptist, to John, he said, you got to do this so all righteousness is fulfilled. You see, as a Hebrew man, boy, G Jesus was under the authority of his mother and his father, um, Joseph and Mary. And so when Jesus was baptized, he was coming out of the the being subject to his parents now to being under the authority of God his father and that's why God specifically said this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased Jesus didn't do anything at this point except for the fact that we know of is to um, um, obey his parents because he was subject to them from the time that he was 12 on and obeyed them but when he became of age and he was baptized, he was baptized out of the system of parents into the system of being under the authority of God, his father. And that was pleasing to God. And I want to tell you that it's so pleasing to God that you have come into Christ because of the fact that the Bible says that when one person comes, there's celebration in heaven. We'll get into that scripture later on in time. But there's a joy in heaven and all celebration in heaven for each one of us when we came to know the Lord. And God said the very same thing. You didn't have to do anything. But you know how pleasing it is to God that you accepted Christ. And now the reality of Christ in you is an inheritance of the joy and the, and the glory of God himself. And how grateful he is. What, how pleasing it is to him. Now to have us as children to it. It's an amazing thing. It's an amazing thing. And this is who you and I are. This is who you and I are. So we're going to get into that a little later on. Because it's going to come in to bring us to our identity in Christ. And it's going to be good. It's going to be good. I want to say to you, you know, during the time that I've been praying for you and praying for us for this time that we're coming into and over this time that we're going to be teaching our identity in Christ, this morning I was praying, you know, and I kept feeling like the Holy Spirit was saying to me, Carrie, I want you to let the people know I want them to prepare for surgery. I said, yes, Lord. The Holy Spirit is the surgeon. And I want to tell you the compassion of this surgeon. He's coming to you, to me. And what he's going to do is he's going to lay you down on the table as we talk over the next number of weeks. And he's going to start cutting out things that have identified you that have slowed your growth, that have hindered you from blossoming to be the most beautiful the thought that God had for you to who you were to be all of the time the Holy Spirit is going to start cutting those things out the cords away that stopped you from blossoming into who God designed you to be this is what is going to happen this is what is happening as we speak because the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said Carrie, let them know, let them know to prepare for surgery. 
So I believe what the Holy Spirit has to say, and I know that he's bringing us into the place so that you can already come to know that you are already free. But he's going to cut away the thoughts and the things, the strongholds that Satan has put up, that you've put up yourself, that family members have spoken over you. Thoughts that you've built up and tried to protect over time. That society has put you in. That a marriage might have put you in. Maybe that your kids have put you in. In categories. But we're going to go to that and we're going to we're going to dissect first. We're going to cut cords first. We're going to come to a place so that you can understand, oh, how great the love of God is. That everything that's hindered you from being the most beautiful flower, the most beautiful blossom, the most beautiful you that you were designed to be. Not just like a snowflake, but look at the stars are all different. Every single thing is different. Your identity isn't in me. My identity isn't in you. But our identity together is in Christ. And we're going to go through this step by step by step, slowly, slowly, slowly. I want to try to keep myself on place of, of, of making point of each point. So that each point is grasped, thought of, and brought forward. I desire you. I desire you to come out and walk into a freedom that has been given to you, just like it says in the Bible that Jesus opened the doors for the captives. He set them free. He opened prison doors, Isaiah 61. He did this because he loves you. He's not willing. God was not willing to see you tied up, to see me tied up, and not be the wonderful person that he made us individually to be. He was unwilling to do it, so he sent Jesus Christ, his own son, to break those things up in his own body, in his own soul as he cried out. And he destroyed those things completely. Every part of the sacrifice was complete. For us to come into the freedom, the liberty, this word liberty is so beautiful in Hebrew, into the liberty of God, which really means to come in to the love of God, the restraint of God's love. God's love on one side, <laughs> outside of it, it is protection. For you hid inside his love, he's a shield. He is your protector. Inside the place of his love, you being in the middle of his love, there is nothing that he wouldn't do for you. And he showed that as an example in Christ. And Christ was the example of God's love towards us so that we could see how God would treat us in his own way of love. We could go into 2 Corinthians 13 and talk about the love chapter as one time I feel that God spoke to me in it when I was reading it. And he said, Carrie, why did I write this chapter of love? Love is patient, love is kind, love is. And I said, because you want me to act that this way. And he said, no, not at all. I didn't write it for that purpose. He said, I wrote it to tell you how I act towards you. I'm always patient with you. I'll always be kind to you. I'll always think the best of you. This is his identity. And he said, come into this. It'll set you free. When I understood that that he was patient with me, <laughs> I could again start being patient with myself. When, when I understood that he always thought kind of me, I could begin thinking kind of myself and quit kicking myself around when I did something wrong. When I found out that, that he was long-suffering for me, I looked back over my life and I went, wow, I need to thank you for this. This is beautiful. You, you are long suffering for me. I did things that I wouldn't expect anybody to wait on me for. But you did. Because that's his identity. It's called love. 
And this is what we're coming into. So I know that he has decided and he spoke and said, Carrie, the thing that I want to do with the people is to bring us to our place personally to look at ourselves. So if you'll do me a great favor and after we're done, just grab yourself a piece of paper and write on it, my identity, your identity. And I want to write you to write things down that you use to identify yourself with. Who are you? Who are you to you? Who are you to you? What is your definition of yourself? I want you to write those things down. I want you to look them over. I want you to see them. And I want you to bring them with you every Wednesday when we go to do this. Because I want to walk. I want you to watch as the Holy Spirit uses his surgical knife and sets you free from things that you didn't even know were a hindrance to you. But to all those things that you do know, come and surrender. Oh, he's so full of love. He's so perfect in his ways that when you lay on that table to have surgery, his bedside manner is so perfect. He will bring up a thing that would harm you. But everything that harms you, he will make a delicate surgery. So that in those things are identified for what they are, because they're not you. And he's coming with magnificent glory. That is his healing ministry. In order to put love in the place where there was something that harmed you at a point in time. I want to tell you that I know his love for you. I know his love for me. He's worked with me. He's done some things with me. I, I need to give you my mom's phone number so she can tell you my brothers and sisters and my cousins. I had an identity that wasn't very good. But I have an identity now that I understand. I understand my identity and I'm growing further and further into knowing my identity in Christ. So much that I know that by the time we get to the end of this, you know that that God wants to say to all of us, just as Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I know that he wants to bring us all as a church, as the church, into the fullness of the stature of Christ himself, so that the church, as one unit, says, if you've seen Christ, if you've seen me, you've seen Christ. Because we will be Christ to those in the earth that do not know him and to one another. This is the identity that we're coming to. And this is the identity that will sweep nations into Christ. Because we come into the reality of Christ in us, the hope of glory. That we become the hope of glory to that world out there. So I want to tell you that I love you. I want to tell you that the leaders you know for each of our churches, Apostle, Pastor Nadia, pastors of your own churches, wherever you are, these people, they labor over you because they love you. They've stepped down the road a little ways that God has shown them their identity so that they can turn back and come to you and bring you the reality of Christ. And so this is what I'm a part of with this. I want you to know that I love you. Please, please, please get yourself a notebook and write things out. Things that identify you. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. I bless you. I bless you in Jesus' name.
I appreciate you. I want to thank each one of you for coming. And remember to share the link. Share the link. Share with those who are around about you. You know, there's people around you that are, are, are captive to something that's an imagination. And they need to be free, just like you and I. Um, I think I have another couple of announcements here. I know that I do. We're going to continue this on all of our Wednesdays um, throughout March. I'll be here with you, uh, the Lord willing. I want you, I'm asking all of you, if you... Um, are not watching and not participating in a church at the moment, come online and watch Crosspoint um, Fellowship, cpfchurch.com. Watch it on Sunday mornings. We have two services at 10 and 11.30. Come and be a part of it. Come and participate. If you're living in Calgary, come and join us. Just go to that address, Crosspoint or cpfchurch.com look up the address and come we'd love to have you come we'd love to meet you we'd love you love to have you a part of the assembly with us if you live in a different city if you're in Montreal if you're in Vancouver Hamilton Toronto Ottawa if you're in one of these Canadian cities there's a CPF church there for you and some people I know you're in Uganda and different countries. There's fellowships there for you. I don't have all the list of the people in the churches. But you can look it up on CPF or send a message or whatever. I'm sure one of our pastors knows somebody somewhere around you that you can connect with. Come and be a part of an assembly. So I'm going to pray for you and we'll close. And I want to thank you so much for joining. I appreciate you so much. See you next Wednesday. Hopefully see you Sunday. cpfchurch.com Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you so much for each person coming. We love you, Father, because you first loved us. And now that you've exposed your love to us to bring us into the place of seeing who you are, we can see ourselves in you as your children. So I sure want to thank you for coming and knocking on our door and drawing us to respond. We love you. And I bless every single one of these people that are watching, Father, and all those who will also hear because of them. I bless them in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll see you next week.